Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Watchlist Investing here on the Oracle's Classroom. Today I'm going to be talking about ABI, Anheuser-Busch InBev, and Heineken, which I've dubbed the beer giants. And so I was familiar with these two companies when I did my analysis of Boston Beer back in September, and I'll put a card on the screen here with uh, that issue if you want to go check it out. It's one of my free sample issues. And you can go check out my deep dive of Boston Beer Company. Today I want to talk about the worldwide market for beer and specifically Budweiser. The ticker's Bud and I can't help but say Budweiser, but it's really Anheuser-Busch, InBev, ABI, and Heineken. And so I'll touch on some of the other companies in the industry, but really focus on these two giants, which make up, uh, in, in ABI's case, a quarter of the worldwide market for beer, if you can believe it, one company, and Heineken, which makes up about 12%. And those are the only two worldwide beer companies that make up a double-digit percentage of the beer market. So I was kind of familiar with the larger space when I did my analysis of Boston beer, but I really didn't fully appreciate just the breadth of operations of the larger players. And the more I got into it, the more I realized that there's this sort of tangled web of brands, cross ownership, production and distribution arrangements, and, and regional strongholds where, yes, global scale does play a part, but these regional footholds are so important to the economics of the global beer giants. And in a really interesting example uh, with Heineken in Vietnam, and I'll talk about that later. And again, ABI really has no peer. It's twice the size of Heineken. It's just a massive, massive presence in the worldwide market for beer. And double the margins of, of the, the entire industry just dominates uh, the landscape. Uh, but that doesn't mean that that Heineken or, or any of the other businesses are necessarily poor choices. Uh, it's just that ABI stands out that much more when looking at just about any metric. Um, I really liked Heineken. There's, there's a lot to like about that business. It's family run. There are a lot of ties uh, direct ties to its founding and a lot of qualitative aspects of that business that that make me really uh really want to pay close attention to that business over time and and definitely put it on my watch list so uh let's dig into the numbers and uh i'll, I'll start with an industry overview of uh the worldwide market for beer Worldwide, the total market for beer amounts to one, almost 2 billion hectoliters. And a hectoliter is 100 liters. Um, that's how things are measured uh, worldwide. And that's how some of the, most of the, the larger brewers measure themselves and even into the spirits industry as well. But just, just focusing on beer. Uh, one interesting fact is consumption per capita. And it was really interesting to see that the Czech Republic blows everybody else um, away by, by their consumption. 189 liters per capita in 2019. And I'm using 2019 figures because one, uh, more recent figures weren't available, but also the pandemic kind of screwed everything up. And so uh, it's a market that doesn't change overnight. These are not things that um, change rapidly. So I'm confident that these numbers are still valid. So Czech Republic, 189 liters per person, Austria at, at 108. And then you get down to uh, South Korea and Japan, which um, only consume about 40 per person per year, 40 liters. And so where does America stand? Americans drink about 73 liters per capita, which amounts to about 212 ounce beers annually. So that's, that is still a lot of beer. 
And then we have to remember, so beer doesn't exist in isolation. It competes against all other beverages, but really in, in the alcoholic beverages space, it competes with wine and spirits. And so it's one way that the industry normalizes things is looks at, they look at gallons of ethanol per person per year. And so I have some data on the, the U.S. I couldn't find much data on worldwide consumption uh, like I could for the U.S. Um, but the trends still hold. And so I, I did sort of a back of the envelope calculation and came up with um, beer amounting to about a third, 36% of the worldwide alcohol consumption, wine at about 11%, and then spirits a little over half of the alcohol consumption in the world, even though it looks like uh, spirits is much less than beer. It's just the fact that spirits have much higher concentration of alcohol. And so when you normalize for ethanol content, uh, that's why they come up ahead. I'm going to take some time and talk about the industry worldwide for beer. And I'll delve a little bit deeper into ABI and Heineken's history, since those are the focus of this deep dive. Starting with ABI, it's the elephant in the pub, 26% of the global market for beer. It's just a huge enterprise. And I won't attempt to explain its entire history. That could be literally uh, a multi-volume uh, book. Uh, it's, it's long and, and interesting history. And, and many, most of the brands underneath ABI's corporate umbrella were once standalone entities. And so uh, it's just an enormous enterprise. Um, but the, the, the genesis of the AB in Anheuser-Busch InBev was the 2008 combination of Anheuser-Busch, the American beer giant, with Interbrew, Inter <laughs> uh, tongue twister there, uh, which was a Belgian company itself a combination of a number of different breweries and those two merged in 2008 with the assistance of 3g capital which was the entity behind the burger king tim hortons deal uh, and the heinz and Kraft foods deals uh, together with warren buffett so in 2008 inbev uh, which was itself the combination of interbrew interbrew really is a tongue twister, and AMBEV merged with Anheuser-Busch of America. And then the final piece of the, the, the major puzzle here was the 2016 merger of ABI and SAB Miller. And so SAB Miller was South African breweries based in South Africa, which merged in, in 2016 with ABI. Now, this was an interesting acquisition because SAB was the number two brewer at that time. ABI acquired it for 105 billion, but there was a lot of a lot of noise, uh, if you will, with this transaction because of all of the antitrust issues, and so because of this, or or. With this merger, SAB was required to divest its interest in Miller Coors to its partner Molson Coors for $12 billion. Its interest in CR Snow, which was is the largest brewer in China for $1.7 billion, and SAB's interest in uh, certain European brands to Asahi Group for about $11 billion. Now, this is sort of just a side note. Uh, ABI also had an interest uh, through SAB in Coca-Cola Beverages Africa, which it also divested for $3.2 billion. So that is a very short overview of ABI. Heineken is a, it's a global brewer. It's had its own list of acquisitions, but it's a much more... <laughs> Sim it's a much simpler 
history in that it has ties to its original founder. So the company was founded by Gerard Adrian Heineken in 1864. He took over this brewer uh, called the Haystack. In 1874, built this new brewery in Rotterdam and began expanding into exports. The company entered the Singapore market with Malayan breweries in the early 1930s and then Heineken still is very proud of the fact that it was the first imported beer in the United States in 1933 when prohibition was repealed. And again, I noted some acquisitions by Heineken. In 1968, they merged with Amstel, which is based in Amsterdam. 1970, they acquired the James J. Murphy Brewery which is brewer of Murphy, Murphy's Irish Stout. 83, they took a stake in a company in Brazil and entered that market. They entered the Vietnam market in 1992, the Chinese market in 1993, and in 2018, they purchased that stake in CR Snow. Now, those are the two majors, and I'll just briefly touch on a couple of the other industry players. Constellation Brands enters the picture here because in 2013, ABI purchased Grupo Modelo for about $20 billion. Now, the regulators in the U.S. forced ABI to divest of just the U.S. business of Grupo Modelo. That went to Constellation Brands for about $5 billion, and that doubled the size of Constellation Brands, which prior to that deal was really just a spirits and wine uh, business, but it's become a, a major player in North America because of its deal uh, with, uh, with ABI. Uh, some other businesses, Carlsberg Group, it's an interesting one. It's based in Copenhagen. It's the world's third largest brewer with a 6% share. And it's sort of an interesting story, uh, just as, I guess, an aside here. But the company was founded in 1847 by a gentleman by the name of J.C. Jacobson. The name Carlsberg actually comes from his son, Carl. And in a twist... The two had a falling out. Carl founded his own brewery, New Carlsberg, and that led his father to leave shares in what's now the Carlsberg Group to a foundation. So it could have been another family-owned business. It wasn't because of that quirk. And it's, it's, a, it's a pretty good business in its own right, but it's much smaller and uh, has some... Uh, risks and some other issues, which I, I don't like, but we can get into that later. Molson Coors is the fourth largest brewer in, in the world with a 5% share, but that's really because of its large interest in uh, the United States. It's the number two brewer in the U.S. and Canada with about a 22% market share. Um, and then Diageo. So Diageo is the spirits giant, but uh, I put it in here because in 1997, Guinness and Grand Met Metropolitan merged to create Diageo. And so while the company is, is well known for being a spirits giant, it really does have a, a pretty major presence in, uh, in beer as well through Guinness. A couple others to just be aware of. Asahi Group, which is based in Japan, has the largest market share with uh, 41%. And interestingly, it also has a 44% share in the Czech Republic, which you remember from a, a few minutes ago, uh, I noted as being the highest per capita consumption in the world with 189 liters per, per capita. It has a pretty, pretty commanding presence in Eastern Europe as well. 32% share in Slovakia, 32% in Poland, 36% in Romania and 35% in Hungary. Uh, and then Tsingtao, which is the second largest brewer in China with a 23% share. <clears throat> I do have an interesting graphic here, which I'll, I'll put up on the screen. 
which shows just the relative size of these uh, worldwide brewers. And it's really it was really interesting to see this power law function at work where ABI has this uh, roughly quarter percent share, 26 percent. Heineken is half of that. And then Carlsberg and Molson Coors are half half of that. And you, so you can kind of see this step function happening uh, as you go down uh, the market shares. So I'll now turn from players to markets. And so the, the top 10 markets for beer in worldwide in 2019 were China, the US, Brazil, Mexico, Russia, Germany, Japan, the UK, Vietnam, and Spain. And uh, I do have a nice chart here with, uh, it's not complete because I couldn't find data on every single market for every single brewer, but I did fill in the uh, largest and, and most interesting ones uh, here. Again, it's 2019, but really not much changes from year to year. And so these are pretty good data points uh, even today. China, ABI has a 20% stake. Carlsberg at 7%. Uh, the U.S. dominated by ABI with 41%, and then Molson Coors at 22%. Brazil dominated by, by ABI through its subsidiary there with 58%, and then Heineken at uh, trailing at 18%. Mexico is an interesting one where ABI and Heineken have... Uh, a duopoly, a pretty clear duopoly on that market. Together, 97% of the Mexican beer market. Uh, and I did come across an interesting article from the Financial Times talking about, I believe it was a Molson Coors executive, talking about just how hard it was to break into the Mexican beer market, no matter how much they tried. Distribution, the consumption patterns just was impossible virtually to break into that market. I mentioned Carlsberg's uh, weaknesses. One of them is Russia. So it has a 27% share of the Russian market. And this equates to about 10% of Carlsberg's business. And so with everything that's going on in the Ukraine and Russia, it's certainly a risk uh, to that business and Carlsberg also operates in many Eastern European countries which again given the connections to uh, geographic uh, location to Russia and the connections there uh, certainly heighten the risks around that. Germany, Germany was actually an interesting one to look at because I would have expected I guess just based on my own intuition about Germany you know you think German you think beer and well it's true that they drink a lot of beer there's really no dominance of that market so there's a company in uh in germany um if i can pronounce this right the red burger group has a 15 percent share abi has an eight percent share and then carlsberg has three percent after that it's really just fragmented among uh, these sort of micro brewers. Japan, I mentioned, is dominated by Asahi and Curran. And then uh, Vietnam, um, and I'm, I'll get into that a little bit more later, but that's dominated by um, a company called Sebeco is actually number one, but Heineken, sticking to our majors here, uh, Heineken has a 37% share and Carlsberg at 8%. I want to touch on the business model of a brewer here before getting into the financial statement analysis. And it's, it's a really simple and straightforward business. So the brewers, they basically have four ingredients, grain, hops, yeast, and water. That's, that's pretty much it, but it's, it's, it's quite incredible how many different flavors and, and, uh, levels of alcohol and and all of that that can come out of just varying the brewing process there's such it really is a complex it's simple but it's complex at the same time um, 
And so brewers combine those four main ingredients, sometimes other flavors, sometimes other ingredients, and they create all of this variety of products that compete against each other. Um, and so just, just quickly in the United States, just as, as a starting point, beer is legally mandated through what's called a three-tier system. And so you have the brewer uh, at the top or first, then you have uh, distributors in the middle, and then you have the retailers at the end. So those are the three tiers. Um, that's distribution. And then uh, sort of end markets, that, that final step, there's something called uh, on-premise or off-premise, or also, also called on-trade and off-trade. And on-premise is just simply beer consumed in a bar and, or a restaurant. And then off trade is uh, home consumption, and so uh, that's the U.S. market. Other countries have this same three tier market, um, and then some have a two tier market with uh, without that wholesaler middleman. And so, again, when you sort of think about the market for beer and the product itself mass marketing anything is going to lower costs because you have uh, not only the learning factor but you have these economies of scale where huge quantities of beer can be manufactured uh, at a low per unit cost and we'll, we'll take a look at some of that those metrics in just a minute um, but for a, a company like abi or even heineken being able to mass brew so much uh, s such quantities of beer allows them to lower the cost. It's a single product in many cases as well, which simplifies things. Some of the craft brewers uh, and even uh, even Boston beer has, uh, they have disadvantages in that not only the lower volumes, but they often have, a craft brewer will also often have variety packs. And so that just introduces another step into the process, which increases complexity, increases costs, and uh, we really see this show up in some of the numbers, uh, which we'll jump into next. All right, so to understand the beer industry, you know, I, I've spent a, an enormous amount of time just thinking about how to simplify analyzing a, a brewer. And I did this with Boston Beer back in September. And again, uh, if you're just tuning in, I'll, I'll put a card on the screen here where you can uh, go download that issue which I've made free uh, for anyone to check out. And so for a brewer, how much volume, number one, how much volume does this brewer produce annually? And volume is tied to economies of scale, not only in production, but advertising, brand awareness, and uh, it's tied to volume within markets and regions. And so it's not necessarily, uh, when, you, when you look at the market for beer, just, just being large on a worldwide scale does not necessarily create advantages. It's really, um, it's really these regional footholds which allow the, the economies of scale to come to fruition. But when we look at, at, uh, at some of the major ones here with Molson, uh, I'm sorry, ABI, about 530 uh, million hectoliters, Heineken 221, Carlsberg at 142, Molson Coors at 82, and then Boston Beer I've just included because I had the information on it at about 9 million hectoliters annually. Um, and I mentioned that power law function earlier where uh, ABI the clear leader, Heineken half, and then you see this uh, halving function again with Carlsberg half of that, and then Molson Coors coming up uh, behind that. Uh, metric number two, operating margins. Uh, and this, this is, again, it's reflected of the, ref, a reflection of the volumes, but it's also a reflection on the company's brands, its ability to price its product, and then any economies of scale that it has. And so I'm gonna ignore 2020 because of uh, some of the noise in those numbers but when we look back from 2016 to 2019 we see ABI with this clear huge advantage 
with a 31% operating margin, a pre-tax margin, compared to right about 12, 13, 14% uh, for the other four here, which is just an incredible indication of the business that AVI has. And so um, it's interesting and just something to note that you know a lot of a lot of analysts or I see I see a lot of reports, not just the, the beer industry but but other other businesses where there's so much emphasis placed on product and while it's important, it's not necessarily something that I think one should focus on too much because, in the case of a brewer, what are, what are they really trying to do? They're really trying to brew a beer, get it out the door as efficiently as possible, and get a good price for it. And so you can brew sort of a mainstream beer, like a, a Bud Light, uh, which has lower costs but a lower price point, or you can brew something that might have a higher price point but has higher costs. And so this, this choice of which beer to brew is really a reflection of management and its ability to uh, create and market a product that appeals to consumers. And so um, where a beer, where a brewer chooses to compete on this scale, and they all compete on various levels to, to some degree, the, the larger ones do, um, but that's largely a function of, of management choice. Um, and so this, this kind of shows up uh, when we look at this third metric, how much capital is required per hectoliter? And so, you know, whether you're brewing uh, a craft, a batch of craft beer, or you're brewing uh, a Bud Light or a, a Budweiser or a Stella, which is, uh, you know, some of the larger brands, uh, you're going to require so much capital to be able to do that. And so it, it's directly tied to economies of scale. And so when we look back over the last few years, we can, we can see that ABI has a, a clear clear advantage. It ha its economies of scale are, are apparent with um, tangible capital of about 47 to 50 dollars required to brew one hectoliter. Now contrast that to uh, Heineken at about 70 to 75 dollars and Boston Beer, which is at a, a 86, which really shows you that contrast because of uh, Boston Beer's uh, choice choice of market in the craft industry. Now, I found something really interesting when I was looking at uh, these these numbers. So, Molson Coors is right right around ABI, and in thinking about why that might be, I believe it's because of their presence in the U.S. market having 22% of the U.S. market, which is where they do the, the, the vast majority of their uh, brewing, is, is a huge advantage. I mean, clearly at 22% of the market, they're getting these economies of scale similar to ABI. And so at some point, uh, you reach those economies of scale and you really can't go any, uh, any, any lower, get any better. And so we kind of see that with Molson Coors. The other interesting one was Carlsberg, uh, which I couldn't, I couldn't quite figure out at first, uh, because when you look at the table, it looks like Carlsberg has better economics than even uh, ABI. And I didn't know if this was because uh, the figures were originally quoted uh, in um, it's it's based in um, Denmark, so the the Danish uh, kroner, I believe. I wasn't sure if it was something related to that, but when I when I at I I emailed an analyst and I came across um, some more information to support this, where Carlsberg and ABI really push their suppliers. In the case of ABI, they're out. 10 months, almost 300 days on their suppliers. And so this is a huge source of capital. And when I looked at Carlsberg, they're out about 200 days. So that makes sense from that standpoint. But my, my question was, why isn't Heineken as quote unquote efficient 
in this area. And Heineken, if you look at their payables, are only out uh, about three months, 112 days, maybe three and a half months. And I, I emailed an analyst who got back to me, I uh, really appreciated it, uh, who suggested that Heineken does not push its suppliers as hard as the other two intentionally. You know, it's, it's really trying to take care of its suppliers from sort of this ecosystem uh, type framework and isn't using its leverage to push suppliers and uh, gain a benefit for itself. And so even though Carlsberg is in the number three position, it has half the volumes of Heineken, it actually has lower capital efficiency or better, lower capital required, better capital efficiency compared to to Heineken. All right, so we'll jump into some financial statement analysis here. And I just wanted to start with sort of a 100,000 foot view and recall all of the industry consolidation that has happened to this point, you know, in early 2022. The beer industry really is at the tail end of this global consolidation process. And so what, what does that mean? It means that it's, it's unlikely that there's going to be major gains really anywhere. And so you're sort of stuck with on sort of a holistic basis, you know, this sort of take, take the whole pie. You're really stuck with population growth um, and then any sales growth related to premiums, premiumization, meaning, um, consumers trading up from lower priced brands to higher priced brands. Um, and then that's all dependent on consumer sh uh, tastes shifting from uh, wine and spirits uh, to or from beer, which can, can impact it. Um, I won't touch on volume and market share because we, we did that in earlier segments and um, you can find that um, you can find that earlier. But I just wanted to touch on a few things here. So it's interesting how ABI's mix, it mainly has these mainstream uh, beers, which is why it has such great economies of scale uh, and has such great economics. Um, it ranks lowest, second only to Carlsberg. And again, it was sort of this question like, okay, well, why is that? And Carlsberg, the answer is, is that Carlsberg operates in Russia and Eastern Europe uh, to a large extent. And when you look at price per pint, Russia has an average price per pint of almost $5, $4.70 compared to $7 in London, $6 in Amsterdam. And so uh, 24 percent of Carlsberg's revenues, 25 percent of its profits come from Central and Eastern Europe, but that requires 40 percent of its volume. So that kind of shows you the the pricing power or lack thereof of Carlsberg in those markets. One one other interesting thing here, when I look at revenues per hectoliter, this is where you can sort of start to see the choice of market show up in numbers and you really need to understand the context of everything because when you look at revenues per hectoliter boston beer stands out at almost 200 dollars per hectoliter but you have to remember all those costs that go into it so it has a higher price point but higher costs in addition to uh, lower uh, efficiencies abi at 88 dollars carlsberg at 72 and heineken at 101 compared to Molson Coors at 118. We look at gross margins. This is just incredible where ABI comes out with almost a 20% lead just in gross margin to Heineken where ABI has a 61% gross margin in 2019 compared to Heineken's 39%. Carlsberg at 50%, Boston Beer at 50%, and Molson Coors at 40%. Again, uh, I just put this in here with operating margins. I'll, I'll put this up on the screen as well, just to 
just as a reminder of just the dominance of ABI and the economies of scale, purchasing power, all of that just shows up um, in this pre-tax margin of 31% compared to that 15% range for most of the larger brewers. Um, I did mention earlier the benefit that ABI gets from pushing its suppliers so hard, and that shows up in uh, what I call core capital requirements. And so in uh, the, over the last five years, both ABI and Heineken, they, they both require about 50 cents of property plant equipment per dollar of revenue. So that kind of shows you, okay, these these guys are, are roughly on par here in terms of uh, in terms of their uh, capital requirements, which would make sense because they're, they're some of the largest brewers, two of the largest brewers in the world. But then when we look at the core working capital to revenue, ABI in 2019 had negative 26 cents. So for every dollar of revenue, suppliers were, were giving it net 26 cents compared to just eight cents for Heineken. Um, I have included Boston beer in here it, uh, as well. And it, um, again, just you have to, to understand the context. When, when you look at the same analysis for Boston beer, it almost looks like uh, Sam has a, a lower lower capital requirements compared to the other two at about uh, 35 to 40 cents of PP&E per dollar of revenue. But remember that this is just revenue and because uh, Boston Beer operates in the, the higher premium market with its craft beers, this causes the capital required per dollar of revenue to, to look lower. But when we look at working capital to revenue, we can see basically no support. There's no detriment, but no support. So about zero uh, working capital required per dollar of revenue. So when we think about how these businesses scale. It really, uh, we really just need to think about um, the physical re plant requirements that these businesses have, as well as some of the uh, I guess you call it uh, income statement investments, if you will, in terms of advertising and so forth. Looking at the balance sheet of these players, uh, we can see this debt-fueled acquisition spree that ABI went on over the last 10 years to, to bring it to where it is in terms of global dominance. It has the, the largest amount of debt compared to any of the other uh, players in the industry, which given its strength, the consistency of the business um, and the cash flows that it generate, it's it's nothing overly concerning, but it's it's something to certainly watch. And we've seen uh, the acquisition of SAB Miller in 2016 shoot uh, net debt up over 150% and then uh, start to decline as management has continued paying its debt uh, back, uh, choosing to allocate cash flows to repay debt over the last couple of years. Heineken has sort of maintained this, you know, 80, 80 to a hundred percent of, uh, net debt to equity ratio. And the other two, uh, Molson Coors and Carlsberg, uh, similar consistency, uh, but, um, Lower level, lower lower absolute levels of debt, and then Boston Beer has no debt whatsoever. It, it just has not operated with any debt in its history, which is one reason why I liked uh, the company so much. And then just looking at um, return on capital, which is something that I always uh, look at as an indicator for the quality of a business. When we look at uh, again, ABI just stands out with a pre-tax return on tangible capital. Uh, in some years, over 100% when we look back in its history, but even its most recent history over the last five years, you know, 55 to 60% uh, pre-tax return on capital. Um, Heineken has been very consistent in the low to mid 20% range. 
Carlsberg, uh, 40 to 50 percent, and Boston Beer in that uh, low, low to mid uh, 30 percent range. Now, what's interesting is if we take so that was that was pre-tax return on tangible capital. If we add back goodwill and intangibles, we kind of get a sense for how management has done allocating capital over time. And so ABI over the last couple of years has been in this 10 to 11% range. Heineken, 10 to 11%. Carlsberg, again, 9, 10, 11% uh, range in terms of pre-tax return on capital, including goodwill and intangibles. Now, when we look at uh, Boston Beer and Molson Coors are two standouts in this category uh, for two, two different reasons. Boston Beer has not made, um, they've made one, one acquisition over its history. In 2019, they acquired Dogfish Head, uh, which put some goodwill on their books. So its returns on this front are slightly lower, but uh, still very good uh, in the upper 20% range. But when we look at Molson Coors, when we throw everything in there, again, I, I almost I call this a management return on capital because it's showing the return that management has, has earned given all of the capital that it employs, not just making this adjustment for, uh, for tangible capital. Their returns are in the, the mid-single digits. And so that, that only leads me to, to the conclusion that management has not been a, done a very good job allocating capital at Molson Coors. From a pre-tax um, tangible standpoint, very, very good underlying business in that 30% uh, range. But when we add in the goodwill and intangibles, it just shows that management has probably paid up uh, a, a too steep of a price uh, for the assets that they have. Now, how does this sort of play into future returns, right? Um, the way, the way I think about it is you have this, you have this management return, which is lower because it includes uh, the spending on goodwill and intangibles, but any future investments on an organic basis, you know, if, if ABI or Heineken, they go out and they create a new, uh, they expand a brewery, add a brewery, all of those organic investments, if they have the same economics as other markets, will probably earn those tangible returns on capital in the double digit range. So if you're buying in today, there's less of a runway because of the increases in volumes uh, just due to the, the maturation of, of the industry. But as those investments take place over time, uh, you should expect a modest uh, tailwind, if you will, sort of bringing up that uh, initial return upward as the business and management increases investment at those attractive uh, organic levels of return. Now, I did mention Vietnam, and I want to talk about Vietnam for a minute uh, right here. Um, and I've saved it for, for, for this section to sort of illustrate um, a couple of things. So Vietnam, Heineken is second to a company called Sebeco. Um, even though it's second in terms of volume, Heineken by far has the better economics. It has 40% pre-tax margins compared to 18% for Sebeco. And I found a really interesting um, clip or um, interview by Tom Russo of Gardner Russo and Quinn uh, who's a long-term holder of Heineken. And, and this is where studying a business really pays off over time. And so Russo points to the fact that in Vietnam, Heineken has a distribution network of scooters, basically, that go out and deliver it, beer, Heineken beer, to uh, end users, retailers, and so forth. In because of the density of its markets and the fact that it uses returnable glass bottles, which can be re reused up to 30 or 40 times, it creates these incredible economics for Heineken where it's not the market leader. 
it's in a country that is uh, developing. It, it's certainly not a first world country. Um, it has lower per capita consumption, lower per capita GDP, and yet it enjoys these incredible economics because of this density of distribution and the fact that they use these returnable glass bottles. And so um, it just points to the fact that regional dominance, density of these networks, again, things that we would uh, expect would create good economics actually playing out in the real world. It's just really, really interesting to, uh, to, to see here. It also sort of points to the fact, <coughs> excuse me, it, it points to or illuminates why uh, why all these sort of cross ownership, cross uh, distribution arrangements exist in the first place. And so an interesting thing I found was Molson Coors distributes Heineken products in Canada where it has its base, its dominance. Heineken distributes some Molson Coors products in Ireland where it has a pretty strong foothold. And so it sort of makes sense that for these brewers, they they know that if they stick to their own markets and, and create this density, it's going to create good economics. And they can do this by actually taking on the production and or distribution of a competitor's product. And so you sort of see this um, play nice factor uh, at work here where um, their competitors, yes, but they also know that uh, if they play along, they can all enjoy some pretty good returns. I'll touch briefly on capital allocation. I won't go into the, the, the real specifics here, but when I look at ABI, its acquisitions really, really uh, stand out uh, when, we, when we look at capital allocation over the last nine years. And the way I've characterized it is ABI shareholders were in this enviable position of having their cake and eating it too. So between 2012 and 2020, <clears throat> ABI distributed 86% of its net income in dividends and buybacks net. And so in addition to that 86%, they also invested 90% of income, net income in acquisitions. You say, well, wait a minute. How do those two numbers add up to more than 100%? Well, the answer is all of that debt that the company took on. In addition, that capital uh, intensity analysis that we looked at earlier, where ABI was able to leverage its suppliers and actually extract capital from suppliers, that supplied $11 billion net to ABI over the course of the last nine years that it could use for whatever it wanted. Uh, and we see that uh, it, it really, th those numbers, when you're looking at a, a, on a dollar basis, you know, $1, okay, you know, 28 cents or whatever it was. Um, but when you look at that growth in revenues over that time, $11 billion it was able to extract from suppliers, an incredible amount of capital. Heineken has been Sort of, it's a similar approach, but much less aggressive, and we see that in the numbers. And so, dividends and buybacks only averaged about 58% of net income, and acquisitions amounted to 55%. Heineken also spent 13% of net income on growth capex, organic investment, compared to ABI, which actually shrunk capex, net capex during that period, um, because it was buying all these brewers. It, it it didn't net increase uh, its its uh, fixed capital investment. Um, I'll just touch on on two kind of interesting things here. And again, if if you want to if you want all the, the good detail, I probably should have made a plug earlier. If you're listening to this at this point, um, thank you. Um, uh, check out some of the free issues, um, but certainly consider subscribing. Two hundred dollars a year you know, 17 bucks a month, um, you get access to all of these back issues, all of this analysis, including the financial statements, but uh, I'll leave, I'll leave my advertisement off uh, right now. So getting back to Heineken, um, Heineken has this interesting 
uh, presence in the UK market where they own a couple thousand taverns. And the origin of that was in 2008, Heineken and Carlsberg bought Scottish and Newcastle, which came with a uh, thousand star pub locations. And in 2017, Heineken actually expanded on this idea and bought a 1900 pub chain called Punch Tavern. And so they're in the process of consolidating these under one brand name, but it's, it's just sort of an interesting uh, capital allocation and operation uh, difference between uh, the other brewers that don't have this presence in pubs. And I, I really can't say whether it's uh, a great a great thing, a good thing, a bad thing. Um, uh, we don't have detail on the the, the pubs themselves. Uh, Heineken does say that it has uh, it does bring the advantage of being able to test out new products and have sort of real time information from its pubs. I'm not sure how much. Uh, I'm sure. I mean that is true, but uh, companies today get a lot of real time data anyway. I'm not sure. Um, the real benefit of it, but just in any case, uh, really is just sort of an interesting, interesting thing. Um, 2019, Heineken invested uh, about $2 billion in CR beer. So it has a 20, almost a 21% in interest in CR snow, which is the largest beer in the UK. And just recently in November, 2021, Heineken announced it was going to spend $1.3 billion to acquire Distel, which was based in South Africa and has a presence not only in beer, but also in distributing uh, wine and uh, in spirits. Both Heineken and ABI have this sort of complex ownership structure, and I'll try to spend a minute and just detangle it a bit here. In the case of ABI, 43% of shares are controlled by a combination of 3G Capital and the three families that uh, were part of a predecessor. 14% are in restricted shares, of which Altria, the tobacco giant, owns uh, two-thirds, so that gives them a 9% stake in ABI, and then 43% are owned uh, by the public. Heineken's structure was put in place by... Freddie Heineken, the founder's grandson. Um, the Heineken family had lost control of Heineken, technically, and so he wanted to find a structure that allowed the Heineken family to own less than 50%, but still control it. And so rather than have, it sort of has this effective dual class uh, structure, if you will, where the Heineken operating business, the actual uh, business of brewing, is owned by Heineken Holding, 50.005%. And then that entity is controlled by the Heineken family. And so they own less than 50%, but they're able to control the business. And this has allowed them to do things uh, like a family control uh, would over time, uh, which is actually insulated management from uh, the whims of Wall Street and others in the financial world, which has been a benefit to the business over time. So let's turn to valuation, and I'll just uh, make two, two upfront comments. One is, this is not investment advice. Do your own analysis. Um, we'll leave that there. The second is, I completed most of this analysis using 2020 results. A lot of it was done in February, and so I didn't have 2021 financial results. And so the, the bulk of my analysis to this point has been using 2020 figures. However, with the valuation section, I did incorporate 2021 figures. So when I, when I first start looking at a company from the standpoint of valuation, I look at what, what, how much cash could it distribute today if it paid out all of its earnings and then divide that into the, the enterprise value. When I do that for ABI, I come up with a 6.4% yield. So if, if ABI paid tax on all of its earnings and distributed all of that to shareholders, the return would be about 6.4%. You add in a, a couple of points of organic uh, growth, 
and the all-in return today might be somewhere around 9%. That's pretty straightforward, and I'll, I'll put the uh, my full valuation on the screen. Um, I won't go into all of the details, but essentially, the company's mature. It's going to have, at least over the next couple of years, it's going to have to divert a lot of its cash flow to repaying debt, uh, which will help equity holders indirectly, but uh, really, this growth uh, the growth phase of the business is kind of over. It might find some tuck-in acquisitions here and there, but um, ABI going forward will probably distribute most of its cash flow. So for the big questions for me with ABI are, it, what does its debt look like over time? I mean, I certainly don't like companies. As a rule, I don't like companies that have a lot of debt. In this case... It all seems to work in terms of enterprise value. So not look not that 6.4% I, I mentioned earlier was on an enterprise value basis. That was not returned to equity equity holders. Um, and then the sustainability of its margins. So ABI has these incredible pre-tax margins of 30%. And you know, it's just this nagging thought in my head, you know, okay, is that too good to be true? Will regulators step in and, and somehow uh, find a way to uh, reduce that for ABI shareholders? Will competition <clears throat> cause margins to come down over time? Uh, I don't know, but it, it is it is interesting uh, that this, this business, such a well-known business, is out there today selling at a price uh, which doesn't seem totally unreasonable. And so I, I'd love to see ABI shares trade, you know, somewhere around that 40 to $45 per share mark. And I'd also love to see them reduce their debt uh, a little bit. Now, that would really get me interested in, in shares. <clears throat> Turning to Heineken, uh, from that sort of gut check, um, distributable cash divided by enterprise uh, analysis, no pat divided by enterprise value, that gives me a yield of 4.1%, which tells me that the valuation uh, is is richer. It seems to me that that Heineken is uh, pretty rich at current prices. It doesn't have that stretched balance sheet that ABI has, and so it won't have to return cash to shareholders uh, in the form of uh, paying back debt. But it's probably going to to maintain at least a fifty percent payout ratio. Um, one based on the fact that generating more cash than it can probably invest organically or through acquisitions. Um, and management has actually said that 50% is about that target. Um, so when I, when I look at Heineken, it's a business that I really would like to buy at some price. That price is probably around $35, 35 euros um, <clears throat> per share, which would imply an equity valuation of about 20 billion. Um, and I do need to make a, a little uh, detour here and talk about the ticker symbols for Heineken. So H-E-I-N-Y is one of the two ADRs, which is the operating company ADR, um, which is Heineken N NV, the operating entity. H-K-H-H-Y is the ADR for Heineken holding NV. Now, I don't know why I don't know why these banks do this, but the ADRs are two for one. So one ordinary share of Heineken listed on the overseas exchange equates to two ADRs. And again, it's kind of a I don't know why they do this. I'd love to know. Um, you can also buy the. Uh, buy the shares direct. You don't have to buy the ADRs, uh, but it's just kind of a quirk that you should be aware of that there's basically four uh, four tickers for Heineken, holding company, operating entity, and then those same, uh, same shares on an ADR basis. Now I'll talk a little bit about the risks that I see with these companies in the industry. First is antitrust. Uh, the U.S. Treasury re released this great report, uh, and I'll link it up above, uh, in February, uh, talking about the 
dominance, the anti-competitive nature of the U.S. beer industry, and focusing on ABI and uh, and Molson Coors. And it's a great report. It's actually it's surprisingly easy to read, um, but it just highlights this risk that these companies are on the radar of antitrust regulators, whether it's in the U.S. or elsewhere in the world, and uh, that's a risk that uh, shouldn't totally be discounted. Maturing markets, it's another one. Uh, this industry is at the, the tail end of its its maturation phase, consolidation phase, and where it, co- where it goes from here, you know, will, will future acquisitions be so richly priced that shareholders uh, are harmed by those actions? Will a price war uh, br- break out? You know, I, I just don't know. Then there's the spirits and wine uh, element where, you know, beer seems to be one of these products that is eternal. I mean, it's been literally around for thousands and thousands of years. Um, but that doesn't mean that in the interim wine and spirits can, can come to, uh, take up a greater share of the market and then squeeze, squeeze the, uh, the the major brewers. Geopolitical risks. uh, I mentioned Russia earlier and Carlsberg seems to have the, the most risk in this front where it operates in Russia uh, as well as um, in Eastern Europe. Both Heineken and ABI do have a presence in Russia and Eastern Europe, but it's not to the to the degree of Carlsberg. But they do have that exposure nonetheless. Um, and then I mentioned the, the leverage with ABI uh, just a minute ago, where, you know, for Credit Crunch, that happened in 2008. If that happens again, and ABI with, uh, you know, $80 billion of, of net debt, needs to refinance, needs to roll over its debt, you know, what kind of risks will that pose for the company? Just to kind of sum up here, uh, both ABI and Heineken deserve a spot on my watch list. They're, ABI is the clear leader in the industry, but Heineken has a lot of good qualitative aspects that I like. It has that dominant market position, just like ABI and good returns on tangible capital and i like the fact that they're controlled and operated uh, by a family who can act and think and act uh, in the in the interests of long-term shareholders molson cores and carlsberg you know i'll certainly keep an eye on those two but it seems pretty clear that those are you know the the weaker smaller ones where abi and heineken are, are really the the worldwide market leaders and will continue to be that way over the next 10 or 20 or 30 years. It was interesting to note, uh, just in in conclusion here with Molson Coors, they recently changed their name from Molson Coors Brewing Company to the Molson Coors Beverage Company. And so they're taking their business uh, in a slightly different approach and focusing on some other beverages uh, where the other two the other three, but specifically ABI and Heineken, are remaining beer companies. And so it was almost, at least in my mind when I read that, it was almost an admission that Molson Coors is sort of, um, it recognizes that it's kind of a weaker, a lower tier competitor in the beer market. Carlsberg, again, it doesn't have that worldwide presence that the other two have. And it doesn't have, uh, it has that Eastern Europe and Russia exposure, which just kind of puts me off. But, you know, it was really interesting doing this deep dive, not only learning about ABI and Heineken and all the other ones, but learning about sort of the adjacent industries like uh, Diageo with its Guinness, but also having the spirits and wine business, Constellation Brands, same thing with its uh, Grupo Modelo ownership in the U.S., but really a, a, a wine and spirits company. And so I could see a future deep dive in uh, in Constellation or, or Diageo, for that matter, as sort of a first step into the uh, spirits world, uh, which seems to have a lot of really good businesses. So just sort of concluding on, on ABI and Heineken, Certainly based on the valuation, one could make a case that ABI is a good buy today. But again, you know, do your own analysis. Heineken to me seems a little bit rich, but um, it's not so overvalued like some of the other businesses that I've looked at where 
it's a clear pass. Um, it's, it's something that I want to really continue to refine uh, my thinking on, continue to follow these businesses, and um, continue to watch them closely. So uh, if you've made it this far, really, really appreciate you watching. Um, please uh, like, subscribe, and uh, please consider a subscription to Watchlist Investing. So uh, hope everybody has a great day. Uh, I'll sign off by saying stay rational.